Spencer Percival was a British statesman and barrister. He was Prime Minister of the United Kingdom from October 1809 until his assassination in May 1812. Percival is the only British Prime Minister to have been assassinated, and the only Solicitor General or Attorney General to have become Prime Minister. The younger son of an Anglo-Irish Earl, Percival was educated at Harrow School and Trinity College, Cambridge. He studied law at Lincoln's Inn, practiced as a barrister on the Midland Circuit, and in 1796 became a King's Counsel. He entered politics at age 33, as a member of Parliament for Northampton. A follower of William Pitt the Younger, Percival always described himself as a friend of Mr. Pitt, rather than a Tory. Percival was opposed to Catholic emancipation and reform of Parliament, he supported the war against Napoleon and the abolition of the Atlantic slave trade. He was opposed to hunting, gambling and adultery, did not drink as much as most MPs at the time, gave generously to charity, and enjoyed spending time with his thirteen children. After a late entry into politics, his rise to power was rapid, he was appointed as Solicitor General and then Attorney General for England and Wales in the Addington Ministry, Chancellor of the Exchequer and Leader of the House of Commons in the Second Portland Ministry, and became Prime Minister in 1809. At the head of the weak ministry, Percival faced a number of crises during his term in office, including an inquiry into the Volcaran expedition, the madness of King George III, economic depression, and Luddite riots. He overcame these crises, successfully pursued the Peninsular War in the face of opposition defeatism, and won the support of the Prince Regent. His position was looking stronger by early 1812, when, in the lobby of the House of Commons, he was assassinated by a merchant with a grievance against his government. Percival had four older brothers who survived to adulthood. Through expiry of their male line, male heirs, the earldom of Egmont passed to one of his great-grandsons in the early 20th century, and became extinct in 2011. Chapter 1, Childhood and Education Percival was born in Audley Square, Mayfair, London the seventh son of John Percival, second Earl of Egmont, he was the second son of the Earl's second marriage. His mother, Catherine Compton, Baroness Arden, was a granddaughter of the fourth Earl of Northampton. Spencer was a Compton family name, Catherine Compton's great-uncle Spencer Compton, first Earl of Wilmington, had been Prime Minister. His father, a political adviser to Frederick, Prince of Wales and King George III, served briefly in the cabinet as First Lord of the Admiralty. Percival's early childhood was spent at Charlton House, which his father had taken to be near Woolwich Dockyard. Percival's father died when he was eight. Percival went to Harrow School, where he was a disciplined and hard-working pupil. It was at Harrow that he developed an interest in evangelical Anglicanism, and formed what was to be a lifelong friendship with Dudley Ryder. After five years at Harrow, he followed his older brother Charles to Trinity College, Cambridge. There he won the Declamation Prize in English and graduated in 1782. Chapter 2 – Legal Career and Marriage As the second son of a second marriage, and with an allowance of only £200 a year, Percival faced the prospect of having to make his own way in life. He chose the law as a profession, studied at Lincoln's Inn, and was called to the bar in 1786. Percival's mother had died in 1783. Percival and his brother Charles, now Lord Arden, rented a house in Charlton, where they fell in love with two sisters who were living in the Percival's old childhood home. The sister's father, Sir Thomas Spencer Wilson, approved of the match between his eldest daughter Margareta and Lord Arden, who was wealthy and already a member of Parliament, and a Lord of the Admiralty. Percival, who was at that time an impecunious barrister on the Midland Circuit, was told to wait until the younger daughter, Jane, came of age in three years' time. When Jane reached 21, in 1790, Percival's career was still not prospering, and Sir Thomas still opposed the marriage. The couple eloped and married by special license in East Grinstead. They set up home together in lodgings over a carpet shop in Bedford Row, later moving to Lindsay House, Lincoln's in Fields. 
They had 13 children together. Percival's family connections obtained a number of positions for him, Deputy Recorder of Northampton, and Commissioner of Bankrupts in 1790, Surveyor of the Maltings and Clerk of the Irons in the Minter Sinecure worth £119 a year, in 1791, and Counsel to the Board of Admiralty in 1794. He acted as junior counsel for the Crown in the prosecutions of Thomas Paine in absentia for seditious libel, and John Horne took for high treason. Percival joined the London and Westminster Light Horse Volunteers in 1794 when the country was under threat of invasion by France and served with them until 1803. Percival wrote anonymous pamphlets in favour of the impeachment of Warren Hastings, and in defence of public order against sedition. These pamphlets brought him to the attention of William Pitt the Younger, and in 1795 he was offered the appointment of Chief Secretary for Ireland. He declined the offer. He could earn more as a barrister and needed the money to support his growing family. In 1796 he became a King's Counsel and had an income of about £1,000 a year. Percival was 33 when he became a KC, making him one of the youngest ever. Chapter 3, Early Political Career, 1796-1801 In 1796, Percival's uncle, the 8th Earl of Northampton, died. Percival's cousin Charles Compton, who was MP for Northampton, succeeded to the earldom and took his place in the House of Lords. Percival was invited to stand for election in his place. In the May by-election he was elected unopposed, but weeks later had to defend his seat in a fiercely contested general election. Northampton had an electorate of about 1,000 every male householder not in receipt of poor relief had a vote and the town had a strong radical tradition. Percival stood for the Castle Ashby interest, Edward Bovary for the Whigs, and William Walcott for the corporation. After a disputed count, Percival and Bovary were returned. Percival represented Northampton until his death, 16 years later, and is the only MP for Northampton to have held the office of Prime Minister. 1796 was his first and last contested election, in the general elections of 1802, 1806 and 1807, Percival and Bovary were returned unopposed Ot when Percival took his seat in the House of Commons in September 1796, his political views were already formed. He was for the Constitution and Pitt, he was against Fox and France, wrote his biographer Dennis Gray. During the 1796-1797 session, he made several speeches, always reading from notes. His public speaking skills had been sharpened at the Crown and Rolls Debating Society when he was a law student. After taking his seat in the House of Commons, Percival continued with his legal practice, as MPs did not receive a salary, and the House only sat for a part of the year. During the parliamentary recess of the summer of 1797, he was senior counsel for the Crown in the prosecution of John Binns for sedition. Binns, who was defended by Samuel Romilly, was found not guilty. The fees from his legal practice allowed Percival to take out a lease on a country house, Belsize House in Hampstead. It was during the next session of Parliament, in January 1798, that Percival established his reputation as a debater, and his prospects as a future minister, with a speech in support of the Assessed Taxes Bill. He used the occasion to mount an attack on Charles Fox and his demands for reform. Pitt described the speech as one of the best he had ever heard, and later that year Percival was appointed to the post of Solicitor to the Ordnance. Chapter 4, Solicitor and Attorney General, 1801-1806. Pitt resigned in 1801 when the King and Cabinet opposed his bill for Catholic emancipation. As Percival shared the King's views on Catholic emancipation, he did not feel obliged to follow Pitt into opposition. His career continued to prosper during Henry Addington's administration. He was appointed Solicitor General in 18. 01 and Attorney General the following year. Percival did not agree with Addington's general policies, and confined himself to speeches on legal issues. He was retained in the position of Attorney General when Addington resigned, and Pitt formed his second ministry in 1804. As Attorney General, 
Percival was involved with the prosecution of radicals Edward Despard and William Cobbett, but was also responsible for more liberal decisions on trade unions, and for improving the conditions of convicts transported to New South Wales. When Pitt died, in January 1806, Percival was an emblem bearer at his funeral. Although he had little money to spare, he contributed £1,000 towards a fund to pay off Pitt's debts. He resigned as Attorney General, refusing to serve in Lord Grenville's Ministry of All the Talents, as it included Fox. Instead he became the leader of the Pitted opposition in the House of Commons. During his period in opposition, Percival used his legal skills to defend Princess Caroline, the estranged wife of the Prince of Wales, during the delicate investigation. The princess had been accused of giving birth to an illegitimate child, and the Prince of Wales ordered an inquiry, hoping to obtain evidence for a divorce. The government inquiry found that the main accusation was untrue, but it was critical of the behaviour of the princess. The opposition sprang to her defence and Percival became her adviser, drafting a 156-page letter to King George III in her support. Known as the book, it was described by Percival's biographer as the last and greatest production of his legal career. When the king refused to let Caroline return to court, Percival threatened publication of the book. But Grenville's ministry fell, again over a difference of opinion with the king on the Catholic question, before the book could be distributed. As a member of the new government, Percival drafted a cabinet minute acquitting Caroline on all charges and recommending her return to court. He had a bonfire of the book at Lindsay House, and large sums of government money were spent on buying back stray copies. A few remained at large and the book was published soon after his death. Chapter 5, Chancellor of the Exchequer, 1807-1809 On the resignation of Grenville, the Duke of Portland put together a ministry of pittits and asked Percival to become Chancellor of the Exchequer and leader of the House of Commons. Percival would have preferred to remain Attorney General or become Home Secretary, and pleaded ignorance of financial affairs. He agreed to take the position when the salary was augmented by the Duchy of Lancaster. Lord Hawkesbury recommended Percival to the King by explaining that he came from an old English family and shared the King's views on the Catholic question. Percival's youngest child, Ernest Augustus, was born soon after Percival became Chancellor. Jane Percival became ill after the birth and the family moved out of the damp and drafty Belsize house, spending a few months in Lord Tynmouth's house in Clapham, before finding a suitable country house in Ealing. Elm Grove was a 16th-century house that had been the home of the Bishop of Durham, Percival paid £7,500 for it in 1808, and the Percival family's long association with Ealing began. Meanwhile, in town, Percival had moved from Lindsay House into 10 Downing Street, when the Duke of Portland moved back to Burlington House shortly after becoming Prime Minister. One of Percival's first tasks in Cabinet was to expand the orders in Council that had been brought in by the previous administration and were designed to restrict the trade of neutral countries with France, in retaliation to Napoleon's embargo on British trade. He was also responsible for ensuring that Wilberforce's bill on the abolition of the slave trade, which had still not passed its final stages in the House of Lords when Grenville's ministry fell, would not fall between the two ministries and be rejected in a snap division. Percival was one of the founding members of the African Institute, which was set up in April 1807 to safeguard the abolition of the Slave Trade Act. As Chancellor of the Exchequer, Percival had to raise money to finance the war against Napoleon. This he managed to do in his budgets of 1808, and 1809 without increasing taxes, by raising loans at reasonable rates and making economies. As leader of the House of Commons, he had to deal with a strong opposition, which challenged the government over the conduct of the war, Catholic emancipation, corruption, and parliamentary reform. Percival successfully defended the commander-in-chief of the army, the Duke of York, against charges of corruption when the Duke's ex-mistress Mary and Clark claimed to have sold army commissions with his knowledge. Although Parliament voted to acquit the Duke of the main charge, his conduct was criticised, and he accepted Percival's advice to resign. Portland's ministry contained three future Prime Ministers, Percival, Lord Hawkesbury and George Canning, 
as well as another two of the 19th century's great statesmen, Lord Eldon and Lord Castlereagh. But Portland was not a strong leader and his health was failing. The country was plunged into political crisis in the summer of 1809 as Canning schemed against Castlereagh, and the Duke of Portland resigned following a stroke. Negotiations began to find a new prime minister, Canning wanted to be either prime minister or nothing, Percival was prepared to serve under a third person, but not Canning. The remnants of the cabinet decided to invite Lord Grey and Lord Grenville to form an extended and combined administration in which Percival was hoping for the Home Secretaryship. But Grenville and Grey refused to enter into negotiations, and the King accepted the cabinet's recommendation of Percival for his new Prime Minister. Percival kissed the King's hands on the 4th of October and set about forming his cabinet, a task made more difficult by the fact that Castlereagh and Canning had ruled themselves out of consideration by fighting a duel. Having received five refusals for the office, he had to serve as his own Chancellor of the Exchequer, characteristically declining to accept the salary. Chapter 6, Prime Minister, 1809-1812 The new ministry was not expected to last. It was especially weak in the Commons, where Percival had only one cabinet member Home Secretary Richard Ryder, and had to rely on the support of backbenchers in debate. In the first week of the new parliamentary session in January 1810 the government lost four divisions, one on a motion for an inquiry into the Volcaran expedition and three on the composition of the Finance Committee. The government survived the inquiry into the Volcaran expedition at the cost of the resignation of the expedition's leader Lord Chatham. The radical MP Sir Francis Burdett was committed to the Tower of London for having published a letter in William Cobbett's political register denouncing the government's exclusion of the press from the inquiry. It took three days, owing to various blunders, to execute the warrant for Burdett's arrest. The mob took to the streets in support of Burdett, troops were called out, and there were fatal casualties. As Chancellor, Percival continued to find the funds to finance Wellington's campaign in the Iberian Peninsula, whilst contracting a lower debt than his predecessors or successors. King George III had celebrated his Golden Jubilee in 1809, by the following autumn he was showing signs of a return of the illness that had led to the threat of a regency in 1788. The prospect of a regency was not attractive to Percival, as the Prince of Wales was known to favour Whigs and disliked Percival for the part he had played in the delicate investigation. Twice Parliament was adjourned in November 1810, as doctors gave optimistic reports about the King's chances of a return to health. In December select committees of the Lords and Commons heard evidence from the doctors, and Percival finally wrote to the Prince of Wales on 19 December saying that he planned the next day to introduce a Regency Bill. As with Pitt's Bill in 1788, there would be restrictions, the Regent's powers to create peers and award offices and pensions would be restricted for twelve months, the Queen would be responsible for the care of the King, and the King's private property would be looked after by trustees. The Prince of Wales, supported by the opposition, objected to the restrictions, but Percival steered the bill through Parliament. Everyone had expected the Regent to change his ministers but, surprisingly, he chose to retain his old enemy Percival. The official reason given by the Regent was that he did not wish to do anything to aggravate his father's illness. The King assented to the Regency Bill on 5 February, the Regent took the royal oath the following day and Parliament formally opened for the 1811 session. The session was largely taken up with problems in Ireland, economic depression and the bullion controversy in England, and military operations in the peninsula. The restrictions on the Regency expired in February 1812, the King was still showing no signs of recovery, and the Prince Regent decided, after an unsuccessful attempt to persuade Grey and Grenville to join the government, to retain Percival and his ministers. Richard Wellesley, 1st Marquis Wellesley, after intrigues with the Prince Regent, resigned as Foreign Secretary, and was replaced by Castlereagh. The opposition meanwhile was mounting an attack on the orders in council, which had caused a crisis in relations with America, and were widely blamed for depression and unemployment in England. Rioting had broken out in the Midlands and North, and been harshly repressed. Henry Brougham's motion for a select committee was defeated in the Commons, but, 
Under continuing pressure from manufacturers, the government agreed to set up a committee of the whole house to consider the orders in council and their impact on trade and manufacture. The committee began its examination of witnesses in early May 1812. Chapter 7, Assassination At 5.15 p.m., on the evening of the 11th of May 1812, Percival was on his way to attend the inquiry into the orders in council. As he entered the lobby of the House of Commons, a man stepped forward, drew a pistol and shot him in the chest. Percival fell to the floor, after uttering something that was variously heard as murder and oh my god. They were his last words. By the time he had been carried into an adjoining room and propped up on a table with his feet on two chairs, he was senseless, although there was still a faint pulse. When a surgeon arrived a few minutes later, the pulse had stopped, and Percival was declared dead. At first it was feared that the shot might signal the start of an uprising, but it soon became apparent that the assassin, who had made no attempt to escape, was a man with an obsessive grievance against the government and had acted alone. The assassin, John Bellingham, was a merchant who believed he had been unjustly imprisoned in Russia, and was entitled to compensation from the government, but all his petitions had been rejected. Percival's body was laid on a sofa in the Speaker's drawing room and removed to number 10 in the early hours of the 12th of May. That same morning an inquest was held at the Cat and Bagpipes public house on the corner of Downing Street and a verdict of willful murder was returned. Percival left a widow and twelve children aged between three and twenty, and there were soon rumours that he had not left them well provided for. He had just £106 fives 1d in the bank when he died. A few days after his death, Parliament voted to settle £50,000 on Percival's children, with additional annuities for his widow and eldest son. Jane Percival married Lieutenant Colonel Sir Henry Carr, brother of the Reverend Robert James Carr, then Vicar of Brighton, in 1815 and was widowed again six years later. She died aged 74 in 1844. Percival was buried on the 16th of May 1812 in the Egmont Vault at St. Luke's Church, Charlton, London. At his widow's request, it was a private funeral. Lord Eldon, Lord Liverpool, Lord Harrowby and Richard Ryder were the pallbearers. The previous day, Bellingham had been tried, and, refusing to enter a plea of insanity, was found guilty. He was hanged on the 18th of May. Chapter 8, Legacy Percival was a small, slight, and very pale man, who usually dressed in black. Lord Eldon called him Little P. He never sat for a full-sized portrait, likenesses are either miniatures or are based on a death mask by Joseph Nlickens. Percival was the last British Prime Minister to wear a powdered wig tied in a queue, and knee breeches according to the old-fashioned style of the 18th century. He is sometimes referred to as one of Britain's forgotten prime ministers, remembered only for the manner of his death. Although not considered an inspirational leader, he is generally seen as a devout, industrious, principled man who at the head of a weak government steered the country through difficult times. A contemporary MP Henry Grattan, used a naval analogy to describe Percival, he is not a ship of the line, but he carries many guns, is tight-built and is out in all weathers. Percival's modern biographer, Dennis Gray, described him as a herald of the Victorians. Percival was mourned by many, Lord Chief Justice Sir James Mansfield wept during his summing up to the jury at Bellingham's trial. But in some quarters he was unpopular and in Nottingham the crowds that gathered following his assassination were in more cheerful mood. Public monuments to Percival were erected in Northampton, Lincoln's Inn and Westminster Abbey. Four biographies have been published, a book on his life and administration by Charles Verulam Williams, which appeared soon after his death, his grandson Spencer Walpole's biography in 1894, Philip Traherne's short biography in 1909, Dennis Gray's 500-page political biography in 1963. In addition there are three books about his assassination, one by Molly Gillan, one by David Hanrahan, and the latest by Andrew Linklater entitled Why Spencer Percival Had to Die. 
Percival's assassination inspired poems, such as Universal Sympathy on the Martyred Statesman. One of Percival's most noted critics, especially on the question of Catholic emancipation, was the cleric Sidney Smith. In Peter Plimley's letters, Smith writes, If I lived at Hampstead upon stewed meats and claret, if I walked to church every Sunday before eleven young gentlemen of my own begetting, with their faces washed, and their hair pleasingly combed, if the Almighty had blessed me with every earthly comfort how awfully would I pause before I sent forth the flame and the sword over the cabins of the poor, brave, generous, open-hearted peasants of Ireland. American historian Henry Adams suggested that it was this picture of Percival that stayed in the minds of liberals for a whole generation. In July 2014, a memorial plaque was unveiled in St. Stephen's Hall of the Houses of Parliament, close to where he was killed. The plaque had been proposed by Michael Ellis, Conservative MP for Northampton North. In streets in Northampton and Northamptonshire his name is memorialised as it is by the main streets set back behind two sides of Northampton Square, London, Spencer and Percival Streets. Chapter 9, Family Spencer and Jane Percival had thirteen children, of whom twelve survived to adulthood. Four of the daughters never married, and lived together all their lives. During their mother's life, they lived with her in Elm Grove, Ealing, after her death, the sisters moved to nearby Pittshanger Manor House, while their brother Spencer took over Elm Grove. Cousin marriage was common, the remaining two daughters and two of the sons took this path. Jane married her cousin Edward Percival, son of Lord Arden, in 1821 and lived in Feltham, Sussex. She died three years after marrying, apparently in childbirth. Frances lived with three unmarried sisters. Maria lived with her three unmarried sisters. Spencer was, like his father, educated at Harrow and Trinity College, Cambridge. After Percival's assassination, Spencer Jr. was voted an annuity of £1,000, free legal training at Lincoln's Inn and a tellership of the Exchequer, all of which left him financially secure. He became a member of Parliament at the age of 22 and in 1821 married Anna, a daughter of the chief of the clan MacLeod, with whom he had eleven children. He joined the Catholic Apostolic Church and was created an apostle in 1833. He served as a Metropolitan Lunacy Commissioner. Charles? Frederick James was the only one of Percival's sons not to go to Harrow. Due to his fragile health he was sent to school at Rottingdean. He married for the first time in 1827, spent some time in Ghent, Belgium, was a director of the Clerical, Medical and General Life Assurance Society and a Justice of the Peace for Middlesex and for Kent, but generally led a quiet and retired life. Widowed in 1843, he married for the second time the following year. A grandson, Frederick Joseph Trevelyan Percival, who was a Canadian rancher, became the 10th de jure Earl of Egmont, and was the father of the 11th Earl. Reverend Henry was educated at Harrow, where he was the only Percival to become head of school. He went to Brasenose College, Oxford. In 1826 he married his cousin Catherine Drummond. For 46 years Henry was the rector of Elmley Lovett in Worcestershire. Dudley Montague was educated at Harrow and Christ Church. Oxford. Like his brother Spencer, he was given free legal training at Lincoln's Inn but was not called to the bar. He spent two years as an administrator at the Cape of Good Hope, where he married a daughter of General Sir Richard Burke, future Governor of New South Wales, in 1827. Back in England he obtained a treasury post and defended his father's reputation after it was attacked in Napier's History of the Peninsular War. In 1853 he stood unsuccessfully against William Gladstone in the election for an MP to represent Oxford University. Isabella married her cousin Spencer Horatio Walpole in 1835 and was the only one of Percival's daughters to have children. Her husband was a lawyer who became an MP in 1846 and served as Home Secretary. They lived in the hall on Ealing Green, next door to Isabella's four unmarried sisters. John Thomas was educated at Harrow. 
After a three-year career as an officer in the Grenadier Guards and a term at Oxford University, he spent three years in asylums and became a campaigner for reform of the lunacy laws. In 1832, just after his release from an asylum, he married a cheesemonger's daughter. Louisa lived with her three unmarried sisters. Frederica lived with her three unmarried sisters. In her will she left money to build All Saints Church, Ealing, in memory of her father. It is also known as the Spencer Percival Memorial Church. Ernest Augustus was educated at Harrow. He spent nine years in the 15th Hussars, seven of them as a captain. In 1830, he married his cousin Beatrice Trevelyan, daughter of Sir John Trevelyan, 5th Baronet. The couple settled in Somerset and raised a large family, including antiquary Spencer George Percival. Ernest served as private secretary to the Home Office on three occasions. Chapter 10. Arms? Chapter 11. Cabinet of Spencer Percival. 